Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I am your host, Marco Berti, CEO and founder of Content Marketing Plaza, bringing you three new episodes each week where I and top-level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. And if you are looking to take an online business to the next level, one of the most important things you need are funnels. Funnels form the whole architecture of the communication between you and your audience. If you are interested in me creating a free funnel for you and you are not on ClickFunnels yet, uh, reach out to me, marketmarketbirdie.com. That will be in the show notes for anyone interested. But what we are going to talk about in today's episode is uh, retirement because it's good to have that plan set up regardless of your age because the more you plan, the more likely you are to re- be able to retire and be able to live off of the money that you build up for yourself over time. So that's going to be the focus of this episode. Today's guest who joins us today, he is a certified financial planner and a behavioral financial advisor who is considered an expert in the area of personal finance. And he is also the author of several books with his latest being endorsed by Dave Ramsey. His company, Pax Financial Group, has made the Inc. 5000 fastest growing companies in the country. And this author, entrepreneur, community leader, and family man wears many hats and understands what it takes to plan for financial freedom. Today's guest for episode 335 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Daryl Lyons. Daryl, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Mark, for having me. I, uh, you have, you've had a lot of amazing guests on your show, and uh, I'm glad to be one of them. Daryl, I'm so happy to have you on the Breakthrough Success Podcast. I'm looking forward to diving in because I feel like it is something, when it comes to our financial prosperity, it is something we should all be planning for as soon as possible. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing your insights on that. Before we get in there, though, can you give us some background to uh, what got you on this path and also got you to start your company, uh, Pax Financial Group? Sure, yeah. I, uh, I'm from... A uh, town just outside of San Antonio, Texas, called Castorville, Texas, and it's a small cornfield town. And um, I lived in a handful of areas in Texas, but that's where I ended up graduating from. We lived in a little single wide trailer on the on the side of the highway, and I just wanted to know how people had houses without wheels, and I just wanted to learn about money. And it was at seventeen, about seventeen, I just became super freakishly curious and so when I went to college I worked at a bank because I thought you know I could learn about money through a bank and worked on the west side of town which was one of the poorest parts um, of the city in fact at one time it was the highest teenage pregnancy rate in the country and Mm -hmm. that's that's where I worked at, at the bank and then I got a degree in accounting another one in finance and jumped into this industry of financial planning uh, the day after I graduated college and I've just been certainly curious about money ever since. It doesn't stop because um, not only is money a you know a currency of exchange, but also how it impacts lives and marriages and families and leaves legacies or destroys families. And so it's such an integral part of our lives that I, it, the, the curiosity really doesn't end. And certainly um, that infatuated, infatuation has led me to build an organization um, called Pax Financial Group and started it with several other people and um, one of them we bought out he went to go work with Andres Gutierrez or one of them was Andres Gutierrez and he went to go work with Dave Ramsey in Nashville and we amicably bought him out um, and he went to go be the uh, the Hispanic uh, Spanish version of Dave Ramsey and, and he's doing real well now and so me and Joseph and a handful of other people got together and created Pax Financial Group which is a fee-based uh, investment advisory firm uh, really fo- focused on the middle class uh, some people call it the mass affluent and we're trying to figure out a way to, to serve that community in a way that makes sense for everyone which is difficult in the investment advisory world most people are focused on the high net worth space and we've just decided to hang our hat in the um, well, middle America which by definition my definition is somewhere between food stamps and a yacht and, and mm. that's about as clean as I can get and that's what we're called to do and it's great that you got very clear on who you serve because some people, they feel like they have to serve everybody. And then, you know, like what really makes you different from other companies that are doing more specialization. So I really like that approach. And 
Uh, with the financial planning, a big part of that is actually having the money to invest. So what's your advice for people who are trying to um, like have more money that they can invest? I mean, part of that is earning more, but part of that is also using your money right. So I really want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, you know, there's, gosh, you know, I, I was broke for so long and trying to invest while I was broke is obviously a challenge. And, and being a broke financial advisor is a very difficult occupation. Um, and, when, you know, but early, early when you're trying to earn a living and, and investing is pretty hard. But it does help to start habits even while um, you're early in your career. The, the best portfolio, um, it's a little secret is an undiversified portfolio when you're right. And what I mean by that is investing in yourself is really the best return on investment that you possibly make. If you looked at my net worth, the majority of my net worth is in my company. And um, that's a bet I was willing to take. Now, certainly if you're wrong, it doesn't work out. But by the same token, I would certainly invest in yourself and your business. But, but it's also wise. I mean, just it's just wise to carve out about 15% of your uh, gross income and just pocket it aside, set it aside. Um, don't look at it, pretend it's not there. And eventually it'll be worth having that in reserves. And, and it, it, it's worth it for a lot of businesses to do that. And if you end up, as an example, own a hardware store and you do everything right, you're a good business person, you've checked all the boxes in terms of profitability and uh, business acumen and cash, but all of a sudden, Walmart moves next door to you, you're toast. Mm. And for those that have saved 15% can weather that, and those that haven't will be in trouble. And so saving 15% along the journey of investing in yourself is really the best way to go. And what's your advice on, I mean, I, I really love the idea of having that reserve because you know if something happens, you're more prepared. I think a lot of, we saw that in the uh, recent shutdown because a lot of people, uh, they were waiting for that next paycheck to come and it didn't come. Yeah. And yeah. that hurt a lot of people. So I like that idea of having the uh, some kind of reserve in place. But how do we get that discipline? Because some people, uh, you know, for every dollar they make, they spend a dollar and two cents. Uh, other people, they just want to invest, which is better. But, you know, we need some kind of reserve. So how do we get that discipline? Well, we know the discipline's a muscle. Um, and this is where the behavioral finance part of um, our industry is really taking off. Um, it's almost taking off like the cannabis industry. Uh, behavioral finance has really become um, quite a, a difference maker in the field of finance because what we've identified is that those that can make changes called neuroplasticity, they right, they, you, you rewire your brain to become disciplined. It's different for everyone, but it's possible for everyone to start creating the little habits uh, that ultimately become a part of your life. And how you do that, well you have some good podcasts on that by the way, but how you do that applies to money just like everything else, just like working out. And so it does require some discipline, self-control and some habits. And, and that's why we hear the phrase pay yourself first for those that do spend a dollar two for every dollar they make before they even get a chance to spend it, automatically drafting their accounts and moving that money over to a, a mutual fund or some type of Roth IRA, before they even get the money is smart. Um, or if they have a 401k, um, automatically putting 15% in there, especially if there's a match. There's also for small business owners, something called a simplified employee pension plan, SCP and a simple IRA. There's a handful of ways you can do it. But those that don't have the discipline, kind of creating these um, these boundaries in their life where they can automatically save money and then spend the rest if they if they can't uh, if they can't force themselves to do it on their own, just automatically doing it. And Daryl mentioned a very important word there, automatically, because sometimes we forget to do different things like put money into a mutual fund or. Uh, invest it or move it to another account so it's less likely to get spent or put into the wrong use. So I like the idea of making it automatic. Uh, there are different ways to arrange that based on what broker you use, how you put it into your retirement plan. 
and sending it out with your bank. So there are certainly different ways to do it, uh, but it is something that we should all be doing at automatic uh, payment plans. Yeah, Mark, I, I'm not that old. I'm in my early 40s, but I've been doing this for 20 years, and um, I've seen a lot of people build wealth by just saving. You know, you hear about it, and you, you, you kind of don't believe it because it's just – it, you know, first of all, you just don't see it. Like you might see somebody build a commercial real estate property or start a business, but I've seen people, I mean, a lot of people become millionaires, multimillionaires uh, on paper um, just by saving. It's unbelievable. And, and it's unfortunate that most people don't get to see it. And so I'm kind of the spokesman to you know, just let people know that it's very possible. And so it's it's just hard, you know. I guess probably when I was in my early twenties, I I didn't really buy it. People told me, and I saw the models. And I again, I spent a lot of time studying this stuff, but it's still hard to believe. You know, you're like, oh, I don't know if that's really possible. I'd much rather live life to the fullest and spend it. But I'm telling you, I'm seeing it all the time, every day. I've sat with thousands of people, kneecap to kneecap. And they are uh, they're accumulating wealth just by saving money, not even being smart, right? Like not even like not even really knowing where to invest or what stocks to buy or how to start a business. They're just saving, and they have millions of dollars. It's unbelievable. It does take time, it does take patience, but it works. Now, are they putting that money into a mutual fund or something like that, or are they just like having it sit in the bank? No, most people put it in mutual funds. It's just a kind of a an easy way to invest. Uh, no people people who make millions they don't keep it in the uh, bank because it just doesn't earn any money and that effect of compounding is uh, it's pretty powerful over time so using mutual funds um, typically invested in those mutual funds typically invest inside those mutual funds into stocks and bonds but typically stocks which are you know stocks that you and I know all the time whether, whether it's Apple or BlackRock or no, whatever but these are um, these are people that are putting money aside in mutual funds that own stocks and they're they're telling themselves well um, I think America is gonna be okay and I know it'll go up and down but I'm just gonna continue saving they believe that the markets will um, reward them they believe that people will still need globally tires and toothpaste and they'll buy iPhones and they'll still pay a premium for a Marvel um, Avengers movie and as long as people still do that the stock market's gonna still go up and so they just they just do life they raise their kids uh, they work hard they focus on their family and they just sock this money away and then they look up and people who are trying to be cute or smart or make big bets or egotistical um, they're fumbling but there's a lot of just good wholesome family that just I mean you could call it just sheer dumb luck wake up 20 or 30 years and have several million dollars in their 401k or their retirement accounts. Yeah, mutual funds are definitely the easiest way. To, that's the most passive way you could possibly invest without having to look at all these different companies and reports and all that stuff. So, I mean, I like that approach because it's definitely, uh, you get to focus more on the areas that you want to focus on, especially uh, for the people who we maybe talk about middle class, like maybe they have a nine to five when they get home, they just want to spend time with their family. So it's definitely the most uh, hands-off, passive kind of approach. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's other things that are coming out all the time. Um, I think my big point is, obviously I have to be careful on you know, making recommendations or, and I don't know anybody in your audience and they need to see their advisor to get specific recommendations. But the point is, is that you don't have to overthink it. Um, you just save it and eventually things work out. And I mean, one of the things that I do want to cover is that a lot of the, like some of the theme has been like, you know, it's good to develop habits as early as you can. The idea being like, you know, the earlier you get in, the better. Now, obviously, in hindsight, we all wish we got in earlier, but uh, yeah. we are where we are now. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on people who maybe they are at that retirement age but don't have a lot saved up? Uh, what would your advice for them be to start building their financial plan now? Yeah, a lot of um, a lot of parents who are maybe you know on the other side of fifty, which fifty you, you t tend to see a deceleration of income, um, but it's there's still a lot of life left. I mean, the people are living 
to 90, it's not uncommon. And so, you know, if you're 55 or 60, you just, you still can't give up. There's, uh, there's still purpose. There's still a lot of purpose in life. There's, frankly, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, to give back. Um, I'm really encouraging those in the 50s and 60s to continue working. Uh, there's nothing wrong with work. Um, I know you may be tired, but you may have to shift gears or, or find a place that's more accommodative to the sciatic nerve that's been bothering you. <laughs> but um, but the idea is is to, to continue working while you can and save while you can. Uh, I've seen people um, uh, very well um, navigate life in their 50s and 60s, typically 60s, maybe 65, 70, um, navigate. Maybe the scenario wasn't what they had hoped. You, you know, life happens in a lot of ways. And it could be bad habits. It could be bad decisions. But sometimes maybe you just had a, a kid that was sick. I've had clients where their their kids were really, really sick and all their money went to health care bills. And so it's no fault of their own that they woke up at 65 without any money. And most of the, these people who end up in that space, it's not a surprise to them. It's just, okay, now how do we do this thoughtfully? And so it does require some thought. Um, it requires um, recalibrating. And uh, the, the biggest threat is just comparing themselves and saying, you know, I should, you know, my, my neighbor has this, has this a boat. And those, the people that spend a lot of time in that space in their head where they're comparing those those individuals tend to, um, I, I hate to say it, digress, um, but the people who um, respond to the to the life circumstances and then navigate um, with a positive attitude, with purpose, uh, they do real well. And and we we know that Time Magazine study, studies have done the uh, the studies on happiness, and we know that those people in that space that focus on their unique life purpose. We know they live longer and have better lives, but financially, what that means is that their um, medical bills are lower, their blood pressure is less. Mm. The idea of them needing chronic care is reduced. So, even though I talk about maybe some pie in the sky kind of Pollyannic, um, touchy feely stuff about purpose, it actually has a quantitative effect on people's lives. And so, it's now what we're seeing in the world of finance is those conversations are happening more and more. And that's why I talk about in retirement. The definition of retirement by many um, by many people is um, disposing of an asset. That's its true definition. The as an asset that that's disposed. Um, I would rather recalibrate and call that pivoting. We're going to pivot into the next chapter of life with purpose, and that helps us reframe and call something what it needs to be called, which is the next chapter of life. And that's really interesting insight because I mean I feel like we see this all the time where. Uh, when someone loses their job at a really old age, they just suddenly lose their purpose. So that sense of purpose is uh, really valuable. But I mean, thinking about like, you know, how it saves money in these different ways, because uh, it's not just about how much money you make, it's about how much you save. So I feel like uh, no one should really be thinking about when they hit 65 or uh, that kind of age, they just retire and stop working because uh, that's not, you're not going to live very long if you do that. So it's definitely good to even if you don't like your job, just have something like, okay, I'm going to do this with my life now instead of just like calling it a career. Yeah, that's, it's just tricky. It's, um, you know, that's why, you know, that's why I have a job, um, as an advisor on people's guides in their lives. Um, but there's a lot of good advisors out there that can, can just walk life with people because it's, it is, it's, a, it's just kind of a lonely, um, lonely time because we and I'm myself included put my identity into my occupation and then you wake up and you've got to you've got to reset but the cool thing about it is is I've seen a lot of people reset in really cool ways like one guy that I know he just decided he was just going to start working on his friend's ranch and fix all his fences and chase away trespassers. That was his fun. His, that was his life. Another lady I know, um, she decided to take a job at a call center. She loves dealing with angry people. She just likes it. Another guy works at the, you know, I'm from San Antonio. He works at the San Antonio uh, Spurs game as an usher. He loves that. Um, but you know, another lady I know, she does uh, line dancing all the time. In fact, she told me the other day, she says, 
Um, I didn't grow up with anybody cussing, but my line dancing partner says F you all the time. And it just makes me laugh and I'm meeting new people and I'm getting used to it. And so, um, you know, I've seen over and over again, people just kind of reset and have fun and make the most of life. And it is, I mean, it's such a joy for me to play a role financially to say, you know, this makes sense and you can afford to do some of these things. And, um, and, and, it, and it, it actually saddens me when I see people go the other direction and, and live a life where they say, man, I wish I could do this or I wish mm. I could do that. And then they compare to other people. Uh, that doesn't happen too much in front of me, but I know it happens quite a bit. Yeah. Most of the time, people are, people are figuring, out, figuring out a way to, to, to live the second chapter of life with purpose. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely uh, more empowering when you hear about people being able to afford this stuff and maybe, you know, they didn't think they could before and they look at like uh, the way they're making money, what they have invested and like, wow, I have these different opportunities. So that's definitely very empowering. And I know you've helped people with their financial planning. So you, you've seen di- all different kinds of examples and uh, people. So I wonder if you could share with us uh, the difference between people who they set the financial plan and they get it done versus the people who don't get it done. Oh yeah, yeah, it's true. There's there is that challenge of you know me people g- giving people a plan. I, I had a lady once who won the lottery, and um, I laid out everything for her. The math was perfect. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. The investment strategy was good, and she wanted to buy a boat. And I said, you you know, it's not a part of the plan. She got an installment sale, so you know there was a fixed amount of money she could spend. And I said that there's just uh, not enough money for a boat. And she called me back and said, um, she called me back from the boat sales um, lot and she said, "My uh, uh, the boat salesman says it's none of your business to buy a boat. And I thought, holy smokes, I mean, this is this is nuts. So obviously she's not a client anymore, but, the, but, but my point is, is that you can certainly set out the best plan possible, but it's your decision making that ultimately makes a difference. In fact, research has shown that when it comes to investment results and, and your net worth, only 13% of that is what stocks you pick, uh, timing of the markets and asset allocation, how we spread it out. That's only 13% of it. Most of our um, traditional financial planning spends a lot of time in that area. 87% of the results of investment and net worth growth is directly a result of the decisions that you make. And so, when it comes down to building a plan, a plan is a roadmap, but a plan is is absolutely um, wrong the day you walk out the door of your financial advisor's office. And so what it requires is constant engagement, constant re- recalibration, but most importantly, um, doing the things that are rational, uh, responsible, reasonable, that consider uh, your future self, your life goals, and your values. And it's really interesting you mentioned that person who, I mean, the thing is you hear about lottery winners and you think, oh, they're set. But you have some of them who they're broke in six months and 18 months uh, because they don't have the discipline down. Just because you give someone you give someone more money, they are going to treat it the same way as they treated it before. So maybe instead of, you know, buying just a used car, then they get this in, uh, flow of money, boat, Lamborghini, and like anything else they could put their way so uh, it's good to develop that discipline which is what we've been talking about uh, throughout this episode but uh, we've been talking about like how we can develop our discipline I'm wondering Daryl if we go a little deeper into you a little bit in the sense of like I believe habits are really essential I know you have some of them uh, so I wonder if you could share some of your habits that you would consider essential for your success yeah do you want to talk um, like me as a business owner or my personal financial stuff either way is good but I mean, I'd say we've been leaning towards finance, so let's uh, go on that. Maybe I can come back sometime and talk to business stuff. Definitely. But, uh, the the personal financial stuff, um, you know, again, I grew up without money. Um, today, I don't I don't have that issue as much. In fact, I find it a different skill set to be disciplined when you have money. Um, but when I was completely broke. Um, we made some serious sacrifices, um, me and my family, especially starting the business, you know, it's just hard. I would knock on doors every single day trying to get a client. 
And um, one of the things that we had to do was we had to put boundaries on our spending. And so as a result, we used cash. And we've heard of the Dave Ramsey envelopes, and we did that. Um, so we had one car where my wife would drop me off at work and then pick me up, and she would have our son in there. At the time, he was um, one. But everything, all of our spending was um, as a result of the envelope. So my wife carried around all the cash in little envelopes. And when we you know, needed groceries and the envelope was empty, it was whatever was in the house, and ramen or beans and rice or whatever. And we did that for... Gosh, we did it for five, six, seven years. Maybe no, it's longer than that. It must have been at least ten years. Now that I think about it, because um, it was hard to get away from it. We ended up getting away from it for the, for the most part. We still use um, cash for some things, mainly groceries, because it's just good for us. We still like that habit, but most of the stuff we don't do that anymore. But for ten years, as I think about it, it was a good ten years. Um, it was what we needed to do to get on the other side of debt. I mean, I came out of undergraduate loan again, or undergraduate with a lot of student loans. So I had to put my, uh, my, my income towards the student loan debt, which took a long time. Um, I had a car loan. Um, my credit cards were equal to my income. You know, think about that, wow. you know, think about, you know, and so we just had to stay focused and, and some of it was a function of, of habits. But not really. For me, it was I came from a poor financial, I mean, you know, lower middle class, poor financial situation. And so I had to borrow money to scrap myself out of it. So then, you know, at that, that point, I had to figure out a way to unwind all that. So it took, took a high degree of discipline. Um, but it was OK. And I, I think, again, I keep saying this because. It is a critical element to the whole process is, is I just got over comparing. Um, I had some friends in law school while I was going through this struggle. And, you know, because they were still in law school is a good point of reference. You know, they were kind of still broke and still trying to figure things out. And I was doing the same thing. But I, I was also around during the dot com bubble. And so I did have some friends that were driving some very brand new BMWs. So I did my best to just kind of not look at that and just stay focused on what I was trying to accomplish. And, and I, I, I would say that's a habit that I really try to embrace in my life. You know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you're spending a lot of time with people who have a lot more discretionary cash flow than you, you you're going to feel the pressure of trying to keep up, even if you have the best self-control. Um, so I think that's a key element is making, you know, taking inventory of subconsciously who, you know, you're spending time with or comparing and then also creating some, some disciplines as well. Um, using cash as a part of that discipline. And then today, in fact, the first chapter of my book, I talk about the discipline of pausing before you purchase with one click pays and Amazon and even optical purchasing. It's, there's no friction to buying anymore. So it's so stinking easy to buy that you don't even think about it. And so, um, implementing in your uh, purchasing decision to pause before you purchase is one of the things that you can do in today's uh, technology environment because there's no friction, there's no pauses anymore. So integrating that, sleeping on it, come back and you probably won't need it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it does come down to the habits as Daryl's mentioning a bunch of good ones uh, that we can use to, uh, whether it's save money or uh, just to eliminate debt. I mean, both of those involve saving money, but it's just being smart with the money that we have, not spending it without a care. And I mean, if you take those habits to heart, I think you're going to be uh, a lot more successful with your money. One other habit I'd recommend, though, is self-education. So like listening to this episode is a step in the right direction. I also like to read books. So with that in mind, yeah. Daryl, I wonder if you could share with us a book that you believe would have a great impact on us. Well, it'd probably be self-promotion if I talked about mine, but <laughs> certainly mine, 1880. That's why I made that book was to help people create some habits. Um, and then, of course, I've you know loved the Dave Ramsey series, Financial Peace University. Uh, Sandy Halverston talks about one uh, called Succeed, and um, that book is a, a good academic approach to understanding uh, why people have good habits and why other people don't have good habits and so I've pulled out a few nuggets from that book over the years so and then the latest book I have is um, one of your guests uh, that just wrote a recent book um, James Clear's latest book oh, is obviously a good one yeah 
Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, all I mean, all those books are good. They have like their different. Uh, Mm-hmm. They appeal to different people. I mean, that, that really great set of book recommendations. Those will all be in the show notes, markabrady.com slash E335. We'll throw in content marketing secrets in there. And my email also, if you want to reach out about me creating a funnel for you for free, if you are not already on ClickFunnels, that is how I'm currently doing the service right now. So uh, in closing, Daryl, I've asked you a bunch of questions in our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? Hmm, great question. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is how will this decision impact um, me now um, and along with people I care about and my future self and taking inventory of that decision relative to your future self and people you care about and not just you. Daryl, awesome stuff here in this episode of Breakthrough Success. Uh, Don't forget to get your copy of 18 to 80, a simple and practical guide to money and retirement for all ages. Uh, That link will be in the show notes. Daryl, are there any other ways we can find you before we uh, officially close off the episode? You know, I use LinkedIn to connect with people, so certainly try me on LinkedIn, and that's a good way to to get access to to me and uh, the newsletters I send out. I would suggest people go that way. And you can always find more about my company at PaxFinancialGroup.com. Daryl, thank you again for coming on the show and sharing all the great insights with us. It was such a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Success. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.